Kirby is known far and wide, and it, it's just incredible that everybody seems to know Kirby. I think one of the big charms to me in Kirby is this mixture of buildings and life. These days, you're divided, aren't you, as to what your profession is, as to where you live. But in the old days, you'd get a professional man. They lived in Kirby just as much as a workman, uh, the fellow next door, whatever he might be. You see the mixture of people. If people had a shop, they lived above it. And everything they did after work was in Kirby. There was four butchers in Kirby and four milkmen. But the normal shops, what we used to have, have gone. It's different. And you had to work. There was no time off. Christmas Day and Boxing Day, nothing else. I think it was pretty hard going. We're talking about the 1920s and the 1930s, the slump. Nobody ever thought of going on holidays or all those sort of things. Life was entirely different. But for a boy, it was great. Mm. Could you tell me, you were born in Kirby? Yeah. You know where the... Um baker's shop is now, about halfway down Main Street. I was born there. Uh, my father was not a baker. Um, he was a businessman, and he made a great success of that business and um, decided to retire when I was five. We went to live down at Morecambe, and... Uh, we stayed there for 10 years. And then we came back to Kirby. And uh, then it wasn't long before the war broke out. I was born in Kirby Londale at Plato's, 1923. Above the shop, yes. Plato Harrison was my grandfather. It was Plato Harrison wine merchant. After the war, 1919, my dad took on the business. He, he was Percy. My mother brought my sister up and myself, and she was the housewife. Hmm. To me, life in Kirby Lonsdale was absolutely idyllic for a little boy. And so, my recollection of our boyhood in Kirby is what the recollection of any boy should be. It was great up with my permanent pals. I've lived here all my life, more or less. Apart from Sedby, when I, where I was born, oh. Castler Farm. How did you come to Kirby? Horse and trap. <laughs> I would be five. Started school here at Kirby. Main Street, we mo I moved to. Main Street, Kirby Lonsdale. Nice place. Quite busy then. Was I married from there? Yes, I would be. Yes, 23 Main Street, yeah. I was born in 1927. My father was Jonathan Wilson, but always affectionately known as Jonty. When Fountain House became available in 1934, we moved to Fountain House, which my mother then rented from Lady Henry and turned into a nursing home. When we weren't doing homework, we were work, working in the house. I mean, we had to, because poor mother couldn't get help. And you see, we had no electricity, so it was filling oil lamps and 
filling coal buckets and setting trays for morning and even doing the cooking. Mother insisted we were all nurses, full stop. And you didn't argue with my mother. My grandfather, he was a, he, he was a doctor, G, GP as well. And I can't remember the date he built it, but he built Green Close, I think in 1906, the, 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 the numbers over the door. It was specifically built as a doctor's house. My father would qualify as a doctor in his early 20s. I think he was 27, about that. I mean, he, he came to Kirby Lonsdale. And uh, my sister was born in 28, and, and I was born in 29. By then, the health service had it uh, partially started. There was a thing called the panel, where poor people were treated by the state from, I think, about 1914 onwards. Uh, so he had panel patients and private patients. And by the time I took over, I think there were 20 of them left. I was born at Halecourt Farm. That's near Grange over Sands. And we moved to Kirby, I think, 1930. It'll be the same year. I was only a baby then, of course. Right, I'm four years old here, 23 Main Street, back door, with mother and the dog, Meg, and uh, my sister, Margaret, and my father had the chip shop. I don't remember much about that, you know, we've been so young, but uh, you could get fish and chips for about sixpence, you know, and, and now, it's nearly five pounds now for a normal fish and chips. I was born at Falliat at Casterton. We moved to Tosca Cottage Farm, which is three miles out of Kirby, towards Lupton. Brother Jim was born there in 1935, and my brother Peter was born there in 1938. My father was working there. He was always around, and he had a huge, he had a huge sense of humour, and he was fun to be with. Yeah, I was very close to my grandmother Fishwick. I stayed there often at the bank in the square, and I suppose to give my mother a bit of a break as a farmer's wife, busy feeding lots of farm men and living people. Born in 36 Mitchellgate, seven of us, six girls and Jack the lad. <laughs> well, my father worked in the, in the forest. He used to push back to Dalton, six o'clock in the morning when they shut off. He used to work eight shy horses. I can remember going with him to Dalton and, and sneaking trees out with the two horses. And there was no wet time off then. If it was rainy, he didn't get paid. Two bedrooms, two rooms downstairs. Toilet outside. <laughs> my auntie was in seven, and my grandmother was in 41. <laughs> A woman called Mrs. Lamb used to own them. They were condemned. Because the toilets were outside, there were no baths, we bathed in a tin bath. And then they were going to be demolished, and now they were more expensive houses. <laughs> Lord Henry Bentick and Lady Henry Cavendish Bentick, uh, they lived at Underley. See, Lord Henry Cavendish Bentick was the half brother of the Duke of Portland. And in fact, he was, uh, he was, he was poor. Lady Henry Cavendish Bentick was the daughter of the Earl of Bective, and she was rich, really rich. Underley Estate stretched over most of the county. They owned a lot of property. 
Uh, practically everyone in Kirby was either employed by Underley or rented their property from Underley shops and homes. Un Underley would own down Fairbank, around Queen Square, and down the main street to about the square, and then Willman's own town end and the Royal Hotel. Kirby was very feudal until the war. We did literally stand on the street corner and doff our caps when the car from Underley came by. And you know, gentry from London used to come up to Kirby. There were dukes and princes and goodness knows who. Oh, even Queen Mary. I remember standing in the front of Fountain House and seeing Queen Mary come. We all stood and waved, you know, lovely. Um, yes, and... Oh, in church on Sunday, the underly pews were underly pews with all the gentry there. They were greatly respected and greatly loved with the, the Bentinks. Whereas I don't think one could say that entirely about Lord Bective. They cared about people and they did what they could to help them. I met her several times as a child. Uh, I remember her as a very kind and concerned person who was very concerned for her workers and her tenants. And in those days, even when people retired, they lived in underlay property forever after with no rent. When farmers became... Uh, came to retirement, well, I suppose farmers often were well past retirement age, but if they couldn't um, run the farm anymore, they were never put out of their home. Keithwick Hill Farm was an example of that. Um, Lady Henry asked my father if, she, if he would take on the running of the la uh, land, which was only, it was only 30 acres, mm -hmm. so that the couple, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, could continue to live in the farmhouse. Well, only made their own gates and fences for the farms. We mentioned the works, just where the dam was, the dam produced electricity through hydro, and the saw, they had big saw benches, and they'd saw a tree through them, a whole tree. And then they used to make posts and rails. And across the road, they had a big key throat bath heated, and, and they used to put all the posts and rails in and soak them in creosote for a week. I can remember the brow being swept every weekend by the foresters. When we were kids, we used to, used to be sweeping it with big besoms. And that was for Lord and Lady to walk through to church. But the tremendous lot of people, about 75% of Kirby was employed by Underley. I'm seven years old, and we hear about this. How, I mean, Lord Henry ill. Wow, poorly. We'd known about people's grannies been poorly. Dr. Dick Matthews was in residence looking after him, and then we heard, you know, oh my word, they got this big doctor from London. You know, seven years old. Now, you, you hear this big doctor. You don't know how big this doctor is. Is he seven feet tall or eight feet tall? Then he dies. And we hear, well, we don't, we don't know. I'm not sure what was the matter with him, but he had a second opinion. And then we think, ah, that's what he died of. He had a second opinion. It was a very, very well-run estate, which was then 40,000 acres. It's now four. Death duties over three generations have taken it away. Uh, I can remember the last member of the family living at uh, Underley, that great big house. It was far too big for anybody. Oh, I was actually in Underley Hall while she was in residence. That's one beauty about having a father who's a, who's a, a blacksmith. He was invited to do things and um, sometimes I went with him. Well, I was very well behaved, and I can remember being shown round, and those beautiful portraits of Lord and Lady Henry, 
that came at one time to the Institute were there in the hall. And I can remember those quite clearly. And well, I was very impressed. <laughs> But there were benefactors. I mean, when it came to the show, uh, agricultural show, um, she in particular used to provide a lot of uh, prizes. Oh, Lady Henry, who was a beauty, I believe, yes, used to have dances. They had dances up at Underley Hall, they had folk dances. She encouraged it. She would have them on the lawn. I went to country dancing classes, which were held in the Institute at Keystwick. Only in 1936, the class took part in this, perhaps, Westmoreland Festival of country dance to Dunderley. Uh, and it was a beautiful, warm summer's day. I was not very good. <laughs> I can just remember going to this garden fair. We were in the field just over from the wall of the house. And I remember mother, you know, putting the tablecloth on the field and plates all around, took sandwiches and cakes. And... Oh, it was a great day. But I can remember going to these children's parties at Christmas in the reading room at Kilstwick. And they were always very nice parties. Yes, that was something she, she did for the children. Because, of course, poor thing, she hadn't any children of her own. I think she had had one, but um, either the child was born dead or died soon after birth. I can remember reading that in the Gazette. So, it was sad. Mm -hmm. mm. I can just remember, I think we... We all stood on the roadside by the National School there. We had to line up. Did we get presented with something? I have a mug. <laughs> uh, Lady Henry Bentinck gave all the school children com uh, commemorative mugs. I can remember being at Barb and Fell and lighting bonfire which had been set there to celebrate the coronation of George the Sixth. I think it was George the Sixth. Yeah, it was a good big bonfire. It could be seen, you could see other bonfires all over the Lake District. I have a photograph here with a band coming down Main Street at coronation with all the arches over the Main Street. As part of the celebrations there was a, a fancy dress parade and we all stood in the square to be judged, uh, and I was a Dutch girl. My eldest sister went as Lady Godiva, and she <clears throat> she wore a, a pink bodysuit, and she had the most beautiful head of hair, and she rode a white pony and a white kid saddle that Dad borrowed from Lady Henry, and I think she won first prize. There were some people in Kirby that thought that she had nothing on, but she was. She did wear a, a pink bodysuit. And my younger sister and I went as the lion and the unicorn and won first prize in the children's section too. I hated it. I hated going in, but what was I want? A, come on, cigar. No, I wasn't meant to be a cigar. It was always a good parade. I think you got a shilling, whether you were dressed up or not. <laughs> the whole town dressed up and joined in. And we had sports days. Um, great sports days, which they don't seem to have anymore. But the adults had sports. And then there were sports for children. The whole town enjoyed themselves. Well, we had a cinema, and there were dances. Oh, the drill hall, which had a wonderful floor. Drill hall, yes, there's a dance tonight. Ah, drill hall, are you going? Yes. Because there wasn't many other places, really. So there used to be the drill hall and the institute. In the dim and distant past, there used to be where the cinema is, and the, the Green Dragon, 
and the royal, but they sort of went out of favour. The dances were uh, very popular. Harry, Harry Willen, I always remembered from those. He was a bit small for me, but... <laughs> yes, I enjoyed his company. Do you remember any details of the dances there? <laughs> no, I think the best forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a shame. They said that the floor in the drill hall wasn't safe. It had the most beautiful dance floor you've ever seen. It was such a pity. We could have been having dances in Kirby now, which is what we're short of. Do you remember anything about the, the fellowship? Players. Yes, they put some good players on. Well, it was, a, it was a, just an amateur dramatic society which put on plays. They were quite good. Mother used to like to go with me to plays. They put some good plays on. They were all good actors. Well, we thought they were when you were young. They put on wonderful shows every year. And they must have been going a very long time because my eldest sister was one of the junior stars. She was quite a good dancer, was my eldest sister. One of the instigators behind it was dear Captain Crosswaite, who lived at Kirstwick. I think he'd been one of the last men to sail on a wooden sailing ship. Uh, the, in the 40s, there was uh, probably 30s as well, but I would be too small to go back. There was a, something known as the Fellowship, which was a bit like the civic society is now, in that they had speakers and... Um, and the meetings were in the institute. Yeah, we went in the fellowship as kids. My father and mother. Well, there was, there was like garden parties, you know, and uh, had teas set up, and you have fun and games at night, musical chairs and things like that. And roundabouts always came into the square, eh? in the market square. Eh? We roundabouts and penny things rolling down and coconut shies and swing boats and things, you know. We used to stay for a week, really. Oh, that was a funny story. There was a, a circus came and Mother said to Eileen, off you go, go and, go and see the circus, Eileen. Well, and Mother, I don't know where she'd been, she came back and there was Eileen sitting on the kitchen table with her legs round her neck, crying her eyes out. And mother said, what do you think you're doing? And she said, well, I saw them do this at the circus and I've tried it and I'm stuck. She, she, she was a bit of a rascal, was Eileen. <laughs> I can't remember what, what I was saying. It'll come to me. When I remember, I'll let you know. Because Jack wouldn't know that, you see. Eileen wouldn't let on to her brother, little brother what, had, what she'd done, would she? Oh yes, the circus coming to Kirby. So that was a big thing in Kirby. John Wilman's Field, he rented it out. I used to be up in Royal Field, uh, you know, with car parkies. There was a lot of buildings up there, that were like uh, wood sheds. And then it was grassland. It's a great thing when the circus came to town. They came to set up in there, the next day, they used to parade the animals in cages around the town. Lions, tigers, whatever. And I can remember them taking the elephants down to the top side of the Devil's Bridge and washing them in, in the river, then walking them back. Uh, as kids, we used to try and help them to put the, port, the tents up, carrying posts up for the marquee. There was always two houses. Yeah, they were, they were always full. And if you helped them, you used to get a free ticket. <laughs> Thought they were grand, you know, tight rope. What's the little performances? <laughs> I can remember this elephant breaking loose and the tent poles banging into him, but it just was going forward. And as I said, we ran home. 
and said, bolt the front door. No. <laughs> Wouldn't have took much for an elephant to push a bolt in the front door. <laughs> no. But you could hear it screaming. It was really mad. Anyway, they got, must have got into control. We were out of sight. <laughs> oh, Abbott Hall. Abbott Hall, yeah. Tommy Clark. Ernie Clark was there, Father, Father Clark. Um, a Clark's farm is at the top of Mitchell Gate. It stretched up to Kirby Motors. Just about opposite Kirby Motors, then Cattles took over from there and it went right down and up to National School. Well, and they had the field where they built the houses come on to Fairbank. That was a night pass. Uh, night pass, the cattle used to stop there and then they were handy to fetch in next morning to mill. Well, there used to be a pond at the bottom of his field and we used to go skating on there like when it was... Uh, he didn't mind you going down there and skating there, you know. I was a nice farm, was Clark's farm. I worked there quite a lot, stripping cows out. I used to strip them out after the units on. I used to turn it up and squirt it into my mouth, milk like that. It used to be only down my cheek. They had them TB tested and they all failed. And, they were... <laughs> and I, didn't, I didn't have took any harm. <laughs> That's true. I've seen it running off my chin end milk. Just sat on a little milk copy. School peak cap on. <laughs> My friend used to say, will you go up for a pint of milk? I don't remember it being delivered, but it would be likely. Nice woman was Mrs Clark. Well, he used to take milk out for him with horse and cat. Two kits of milk, one strapped at side with a tap on the bottom. Then when it empty, you used to get to the kit and pour it into that with tap on it. You knew who went, who wanted the milk. Every day they, they, they wanted a gill of milk. And you knocked on the door and opened it. You didn't wait for them coming in. It, the, the container would be just on the table inside. So you put what you want and money would be there. A basin, a number of jug go out. <coughs> pour it in there and also pour a little bit, a spoonful out at the top. You think you're giving good measure then, isn't it? <laughs> well, it was whilst we were living at uh, Morecambe and I developed um, scarlet fever. And Mother had a talk with the doctor at Morecambe. He said, I think Joan could do with it a holiday. That will do her good. And uh, we had a, a week here, and uh, each morning we went out on Jaunty's ponies, with him, of course, and uh, we ate very well at Mrs Clark's. We just thoroughly enjoyed it we at the end of the week. We look, looked like different people. I used to help hair time. All by hand in them days, shaking it out, rolling it up, put it into plaits, loose in there, take it down into the barn, put it into the barn. You used to get your tea for that. <laughs> well, when we were near field, she used to bring the tea out in the afternoon. Used to sit in the fields. Mind that's when the sun used to shine for six weeks. <laughs> Not two days. Uh, and we'd go. Ploughing and rolling, picking two wheat eggs up off the field. There's hundreds of them. Fill a basket full of eggs. And he used to say, where the horse, take the eggs out of the way, roll it, and where the horse's hoof had been, put the eggs back. It, 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 it used to come back to them. Mitchell, yeah, do you remember? That was the slums of Kirby at one time. And now they're all done up, the beautiful cottages now. But they were, they were all very poor people on Mitchell Gate. They weren't the desirable holiday cottages that they are now. I, I think they were, they were just so old. Now right at the top was a mill. Have you heard that? 
they made clog carcass and nails. And that is right at the top. There's 41 Mitchell Gate in the top corner and there's an alleyway down and then you turn right down steps and there's a big building. Well, there used to be a, that used to be a, a clog factory. They used to make nails and all, you know, they, they were pointed shaped nails for clogs, don't they, with a big head on. My father used to sit in front of the fire, putting new clog carcass on my clogs and new woods on them and putting all the brass studs all the way around them. And they used to take the wooden sole off when it had worn. And if you didn't tell father soon enough, you'll get a clip under you because you want wooden sole. So you had to, to put a new wooden sole on, take all the brass studs all the way out, put it on and take them all back, then put your clog carcass on. And the minute put them on, we used to go and put them on one side and skid them along. Flags like that make sparks. <laughs> all the farmers wore them. Very warm. Well, my father always worked in the in the forest, and he used to put straw in his his to keep his feet warm. Not fur land like they are today. <laughs> there was Mr. Clark at Abbott Hall, and of course the Bentinks. My wife's father had a farm at Burrow, so he would be bring stuff into Kerry. Well, there'd be an auction day on a Thursday. And there were sheep and cattle, and then at Christmas there was uh, dairy, dairy shows, you know, cattle, dairy, dairy cows and all that, you know. I think James Thompson was the last of the auctioneers. My father was working there up to the seven, late 70s when it ceased to be an auction mart. Before he was the auctioneer there, he was secretary to the auction mart. And he had a part-time job there from leaving school as an assistant to the secretary to the man. On the left, as you're facing the Trustee Savings Bank, whatever it's now called, mm -hmm. the, the, the animals were kept down there. I remember looking out of Savings Bank, um, all the sheep pens were just over the wall from the savings bank, so you could see the sheep. Hundreds of sheep and cattle. And, and the building that looks west at the back of that yard was, was all part of the whole setup, animal foods and all sorts of things. The cottages in Salt Pile Lane, I've only just stopped calling them the slaughterhouse houses. <laughs> Because that, that length of building was the slaughterhouse. I remember riding a top round square. <laughs> it had broken out at auction man and was going round and I jumped on its back and <laughs> round the market square. Back of Green Dragon Yard in the yard, I drove pigs down there. Horse and carts used to go through. They used to serve the mares in there. The stallion used to come from Whittington, down at Mackworth. They used to serve the mares, in, walk them through an uphorse market into that yard, serve the mares. They didn't pay if it hadn't to fall, so they'd have to wait to see. But I can remember them coming into there. It, it was funny, really. All, all the farmers used to come in, you know, and then they used to go to the Royal Domino in, play dominoes and a few pints, if they'd sold the castle or sheep. With a bit of money, you see. Uh, then, of course, the motor cars came, the cattle wagons came. But before that, all this stuff was moved on the roads with men and dogs. If, if there was a buyer from Leeds Court buying sh sheep to be slaughtered, lambs, they'd drive them all into the, into the yard and get them all together and then drive them up to Kirby Station and, and I used to be behind them. Running away up to Kerbis and then run all the way back for nothing. <laughs> as I say, my father used to drive sheep up to, I used to help him as a young lad, uh, sheep and the cattle up to the Kirby station. And there was very little traffic as such, 
but the two good dogs and they used to go round and round them, you know, and keep them all together. I can remember going up with Mr. Mac, Billy MacFarlane with a flat wagon and putting stuff on out of, out of the station yard to deliver around the shops in Kirby. All sorts of parcels. Mr. Wetton was the station master and my family <coughs> owned uh, Harrison Brewers coal merchants. Dad ran the, the business the books, and Fred had a, a lorry and, and ran this half of this coal business, Harrison Brothers. So one of my first jobs was shoveling coal. The, the engine came to Curry Station, went a little bit further along and, and puffed its way back in to shove these railway wagons. And they cost so much a day to keep on the station. So they had to be emptied all the coal had to be emptied onto the ground as fast as possible. And of course, one of the wonderful things I learned there, you could move a wagon full of coal quite easily with a metal bar and you just put it under the wheel and did like that. But as a small boy, I used to envy Mr. Wetton, the station master, very smart fellow with the buttons and cap and all the rest of it. <coughs> And outside the, the station, uh, on the yard side, there was a machine that if you put a penny in, you could get a bar of Nestle's chocolate. And I got the idea that what I would like to do, I would like to be a station master. So I could just put pennies in, get some chocolate and get the penny out again. I mean, it was, seemed, seemed, that seemed to me the ideal sort of occupation. Um, when we lived on Holling Bank, you could see the the steam trains as they were then uh, chugging away up the valley. Yes, it was it was quite quite interesting to see. You know, several times a day you would see them. Skipped them, skipped them all along all all the way along that line. Curry Station went along to Barbon to Sedba and finished up at Tea Bay. And if you wanted to get to Kendall, at Tea Bay you changed to Oxenholm. At Oxenholm you changed to Kendall. It was a whole day business. And you had all this jiggling about to do. And the same way to come back. One then either had to hike the two miles back into town with your luggage, or if you were very lucky, uh, somebody would have sent a taxi. There were no buses. I usually walked. At the age of four, I was used to walk up crossing the Devil's Bridge, and I went up to uh, to Summerfield, you know, big house, Summerfield, where there was a governess for lessons. The, the road came down and then across and then down again, that long bit. And it, it, by, by my memory, it was doing that. Though I gather originally it didn't come that way. It went across beyond the trees and then down the little lane. I remember standing on the Devil's Bridge. On the right hand side was an AA man. And there were, in daylight hours, there was always an AA man there. And he directed the traffic either way. Yes, I remember you used to ride about on a motorbike. You lived at Rob Rain. Yeah, it was a motorbike, a sidecar. What did you call him? Was it Preston? Preston, was it, Mr Preston? No, I can remember seeing the AA man on the bridge. Uh, well, he had to direct traffic, I mean. <laughs> it was, as I say, literally one-way traffic. He was quite a character, as I remember. I remember being on the Devil's Bridge when Stanley Bridge was being built. Yes, I do just remember before it opened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you could stand on the old Devil's Bridge and see it gradually being built. There was a lot of timber for the bridge to be shaped, you see. 
and there was a big flood and all that woodwork was washed down the loon. So every farmer all the way down the loon had timber forever. I remember men came here, labourers and so forth, came here. Some of them married local girls. A man called Sloan who married a, one of Sam Morris's daughters. And at that time, my dad had a two-ton Leyland wagon to bring a stone down from Hutton Roof Quarry to build a bridge. There was a sort of little railway track uh, alongside the road, a trolley on wheels that they could unload a, a wagon uh, halfway down the hill into these things that would actually go down to where the, where the bridge was being built. The Stanley Bridge was opened in 1932. Because I remember my mother saying she took us down, but I can't remember it, because I was born in 32. I remember the day, because it's the year I was born. I wasn't very old, and I can remember being taken in a pushchair because I couldn't walk. I've got a picture somewhere of the opening. Right, Sergeant Robinson there. Yeah. Yep. Miss Taylor, mm -hmm. she and her sister made cakes that went all over the empire. Miss, Miss Taylor's cakes. My mum is just over that shoulder. There were several Mrs Harrisons, but my mum was the only Mrs Percy Harrison. I think that is the, that is the engineer who made the bridge. That's Mr. William Wolfenden. That's Lady Henry Cavendish Bentinck. This is Mr. Pattinson, the chairman of the county council. Mm -hmm. This is the Honourable Oliver Stanley. Oliver Stanley being the MP for Westmoreland, that's why it's called Stanley Bridge. MPs could do things in those days. And he got it right. He made it big enough. It's extraordinary to think. I mean, there were a few cars probably a hundred cars a day going over the Devil's Bridge. And he, he realised that this was, this was, a, this had to happen. The Honourable Oliver Stanley opened it and standing very close uh, is me, aged nine years old. And as soon as he cut the ribbon, I ran across. So I was the first man to cross the bridge. Uh, and what you now call the bypass is Bentinck Drive, opened on the same day by Lady Henry, Henry Cavendish Bentinck. Between Townend and their field, there had been a cottage which had to be removed to make the A65. But I can't remember who lived there. And Bentinck Drive, of course, was wonderful for roller skating on. Before, before when, when it was built and not open, it was a great place to roller skate. Mm. I, I remember that lorry that went down and, and smashed the uh, uh, bit of limestone that there was and finished up nearly going over the bridge. And it was half balancing, but he'd managed to get back and get out. The man had actually mistaken the road. I think he'd got down the wrong road accidentally in the dark. And the driver couldn't, his door was stuck, so he had to get out the other side. And at dawn, when he went down to see what had happened, realised that if he'd got out the door he wanted to get out of, he'd have gone right down. I remember that. I believe he fainted when he realised what had happened and how near to his meeting his, his maker had come. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> Alfred Harris of Loonfield. I mean, he, there's stories for him forever. <clears throat> Alfred Harris was here in the 1870s <clears throat> and rebuilt the house and put the drains into Kirby Lonsdale. He was a very uh, generous, rich man. And you know, you could come over the over the bridge and you'd see Loon Field with its lovely tower there. And it was it was beautiful. It really was a beautiful building. Hideous nineteenth century build, building put up by 
somebody with too much money and no sense. It was tall, completely, it was, it was even uglier than most Victorian houses. Loon Field was used as an army barracks during the war. And then before that, it was a cooperative holiday home. An organisation called the Holiday Fellowship, was it called, which I think still exists, where you could have units in the thing and use them in places. And it was one of those places till the army at the beginning of the war took it over and ran it as, as a, a military base with 300 Royal Engineer. That's me. <laughs> Young bird. <laughs> Loomfield House. It was a guest house. We no business to be in there, I don't think. It's in private gardens, really. Well, we used to run in there as lads, you know. Uh, where the Green Square flats are, uh, they weren't built then, you know, and all that was uh, um, raspberry canes and we had gang huts in there. And all that land below, which was, comes down towards the cricket field, was ornamental gardens at one time. Oh, fancy, lovely, lovely garden. And down in the bottom where the garden was, was beautifully laid out, there was arches in the garden where the footpaths were. And they used to chase us out as, as lads, you know. Arthur Robinson, and there was a Jack Jackson. My very first memories would be of Loonfield Gardens, which was the kitchen garden for the mansion. Mr Robinson ran it as a market garden. Originally, he must have been the head gardener and lived in the gardener's house in Back Lane. He used to garden it and sell vegetables out. I used to deliver vegetables out of there around town. <laughs> Cabbages and potatoes to different houses. My granny used to send me to, to buy a lettuce from Mr Robinson. And I can remember going with him through uh, a door to get a lettuce from a, uh, a big greenhouse immediately behind the kitchen end of the hall. He had all sorts of plants and, and greenhouses with cucumbers and stuff hanging down. And it was just a bonny, a lovely place down there, you know, and, and the big house, the massive, massive house, like, and then it was all pulled down, you see. When the, when the army went, that was it. That was it. Fred Cook kept the gasworks at Kirby, and Harrison Brothers supplied the coal that went down the brow. Uh, to feed the retorts. My uncle used to drive the wagon, taking the coal down. It was a bit hair-raising, taking a wagon of coal down there. But, you know, there were two gasometers, a great big cylinder where the gas was stored. One was red and one was green. I think the red one was near the gas house, and I have a feeling the, the green one was under Mill Brow. But they used to tell you to go down if you got bronchitis, to, and breathe fumes out. <laughs> I know it's where, where people took their pets that had died to have them incinerated. <laughs> For one thing. We used to go in there sometimes to keep warm when they were stalking up, you know. As one opened the door, which is now their front door, as it were, um, there was this great big furnace Maybe Fred Cook with his sleeves rolled up, shoveling. I can remember, I can remember that, yes. A big process, you know, and, and all by hand. You know, it's not like it is now, fed with an auger. I can remember going in and watching them fill the retorts up. Looks a call like that, shoveling it in. And then that was sealed with slaked lime, so that it was, it was a, an airtight oven. The furnace underneath was just white hot, you know, and it used to put heat around the ovens. Which cooks the coal in the top bit. And the, that coal disintegrates and gas comes off and goes into a, a washing tower. And in the washing tower is uh, ammonia. 
and the gas contains sulfuric acid. So the two combine, you get ammonium sulfate to uh, fertilize the land. What comes away down at the bottom is tar, and you see that tar is pretty useful stuff as well. There was a big tank outside where the tar used to run down the pipe from the coal, and I remember going down when I was an apprentice and got a five gallon of tar and cresol tar for tar in the tin sheds. So you've got tar and you've got gas, you've got ammonium sulfate. Then cork used to come out and my uncle used to load it up and take them out schools for school boilers. We used to go down with an oak pram and pick cork off the river bank where they used to empty the furnace out and tip it down and there was cork. We used to pick the cork up into a bag and burn it at home. Fred Cook and his wife had a son called Johnny. And every Christmas, I had to take a, a, a box of chocolate and some balloons down to, to Johnny, who was very, very seriously disabled. I was just so severely mentally disabled. Um, they ha he had to be tied to the chair arms to stop him eating and they had to take his teeth out. And he was tall and thin and bigger than either of his poor little parents and they had to lift him everywhere. He'd be five, six foot. Mrs Coote used to push him up that bow. Push him up in the wheelchair from the bottom of the brow up to the top. Hard work. Mm. And Mrs Cook I always think it was the bravest person I ever knew because she would shove this chair up the, up, the brow, up the brow and she was always cheerful and nice. She must have been a strong woman. And after his father died, his mother moved on to Rob Rain and she couldn't cope. She died and John died then. But because uh, she couldn't, she really couldn't look after him, poor dear. It was terribly sad. It really was. Down brow, down mill brow. Oh yes, down the hill. Yes, that was where the tramps stayed overnight, shilling a night. Mm. Any tramps? Well, you don't see any tramps now, really. They used to put go there, and uh, they're what they call deal housing in cellars. I think they had to provide for themselves, but. There would be no facilities for cooking anything. Mother always made them sit on the doorstep and eat it there and then. Um, if it was food they wanted, she wouldn't give them money. Late one night we heard the front door open and Mother went out and there was this man laughing his head off. And she sort of said, uh, can I help you? And he said, well, he'd just been into one of the patient's rooms and seen this dear old lady lying in bed, realised he was in the wrong place and said, hey, missus, I thought it was the lodging house. So, <laughs> because nobody locked the doors in those days. You never thought about it. There used to have a lot of Irish people used to come across for hay time and, and work on farms and all that. Dad used to keep a, sh a clean shovel in the smithy, and if people wanted to cook the breakfast, providing they did it before nine o'clock, they were welcome to use the smithy fire. They could, you know, they could fry bacon or eggs or whatever on the shovel on the fire, or boil a, boil a billy can or something. He would have gypsies. Gypsies never touched a thing. But the travellers, would lift anything that was movable. If he thought there was, if he thought travellers were around, everything was locked. But not with gypsies. They never touched a thing. They were honest and clean and well behaved. Well, you see, the Pearsons who had good connections. There was the Pearson that lived at Brantow, who had been what governor of Cyprus or somewhere, and there was. There was another one down the, the valley. I mean, the Pearsons were 
people of importance, yes. I remember him as, as a solicitor and walking around. I can always remember him with a, a walking stick and a, stick and a trilby hat and usually a dog. I'm sure he always had a dog. Um, he always had a genial smile. And I can remember that he was the one that bought our present font. Oh, yes, he, he bought the brow and gave Kirby the brow. Put a lot of money in it, didn't he? I can, I can, I've heard about all that. He had a fund for the brow. I know he was a great man for town. Oh, he was quite a flamboyant character. Yes, he was. But yes, he had a, a presence. No, not always popular, but yes, he was well known in Kirby. And uh, he live, lived at uh, this beautiful house. At least the situation was beautiful, I should say. It was only the outside and the garden, the, the setting. Well, I could be kind and call it a treasure house. No, I find it hard to judge it. I think I was at an age where even if it had been a rubbish tip, I would have thought it was nice. Because <laughs> all those sort of people had maids and that, you know, he wrote a book, didn't he, The Annals of Kirby Lonsdale. And The uh, Doings of a Country Solicitor. But he still had a finger in the pie at uh, Pearson and Pearson's. I was still a young woman, but uh, I, I used to enjoy going and reading for him and uh, sit in the garden with a cup of tea, I have a chatter with him. I, I just enjoyed his company. He was born at Begins, 1893. When he was 13, Dad left school and went as an apprentice blacksmith to Underley. The First World War broke out. Being a, a farrier, he was in the cavalry, Westmoreland and Cumberland Yeomanry. He became a messenger, riding between the trenches, and um, he became a cartographer, drawing maps. And then he came back to Kirby and worked for Mr. Jackson, who was George Harrison's uncle. Uncle Wob, it was, uh, it was uh, Wob Jackson's blacksmith. And, and Jonty worked for him, you see. Oh, if ever, if ever you get a chance to read the indentures, they are hilarious. He had to be a sober and um, attend church and um, be of good character. <laughs> but when I used when I was at school, of course, I would, would call on Uncle Wob <coughs> and he would have a toffee for me. With strict orders not to touch any bit of metal. So I had to try it out, of course. And <laughs> I learned not to touch bits of metal. Yeah. Uncle Wob. His son uh, was killed in the 1914 war. When you look at that war memorial and think of those 50 young men. Wob Jackson having lost his only son, who was also a farrier, and also, I believe, in the Westmoreland and Cumberland Yeomanry, did eventually sell the smithy to my father. He was still rented from Underley, but he'd bought the business, if you understand. But if ever Underley wanted anything doing, horses showing, anything on the estate mending, it came first. They got priority. Um, and he worked there until he was 84. Oh, John T. I ah, well, I've spent many an hour with John T. as a young lad. He'd have a shy of horse, a Clydesdale outside, a cart horse. He used to say to me, just run that horse up there, Jack. And I used to run it fair bang. 
see if it was throwing a leg out. You know, it could throw a leg out that way, and then he'd wait. The shoe, shoe accordingly to fetch its leg in, put a bit of weight on that side to pull it in, a bit of weight that out. And he'd, he'd weigh it up, and then make it shoe. And the next door to John did was the, was the joiner shop, wearing the joiner's foot wearing. And he used to make the cart wheels. Then John would make the iron rim to go around. On a Saturday morning, if I could escape from my loving mother, I used to go and pump the, the fire for, for Horace. I, when I was 11, I was in love with Horace. He was a lovely man. <laughs> and um, he was Dad's apprentice. But unfortunately, during the war, Horace had to go on to, to Windermere and build, build um, aeroplanes. <coughs> Take a sledge up to Jonty in the morning. Could you put my sledge runners on? I'd pick it up tonight. And they'd be half mound runners, countersunk in, and bowed up so you could hold it like that. And they'd be cleaned off, sanded off, shining. How much did Sir Wilson? One and six. You couldn't get screwed for that. <laughs> countersunk in. I remember John T and his horses. Just to ride past here. I used to take his uh, ponies down onto the island. He hired the island to graze them on. Hay time, and we used to pick more grass all up, bypass, and let it wither. I'd scale up and then load it onto a cart. And we used to mow playing field, kids' playing field. We used to scale that out, and then I used to fetch it in and take it down to that barn halfway down Mitchell Gate. Back it into there. Anyway, on churchyard, we used to go and cut grass on churchyard and make it into hay. That's into there. I had his riding horses, two, a black one and a chestnut, a little bear one. Dinky and radio. Crummock was a big one, man. He was the gentlest, most wonderful horse ever, and he had a lovely, soft, velvety nose. Used to sort of nicker you. Ooh. <laughs> I could crawl under his tummy and hang on his tail, and he never batted an eyelid. Then there was Radio and Dinky, who were always together. They were never separated. And when one died, the other died. Yes, Dinky and Radio. Yeah. Well, can you tell me, can you tell me a bit about that? Well, uh, all I know is that at the age of seven, I suppose. I, I it was thought I got an idea to, to learn to ride a horse, so I used to go, my sister and I, who was a year older than me, used to go to Jonty's Smithy, where he kept his horses for, for where, he, where he wasn't blacksmithing. I think Dinky was the slightly smaller of the two, and my sister, being a year older than me, had the bigger, bigger pony. She had radio, which was black, and I had Dinky, which was brown. <laughs> That's all I can remember about it. I don't know where we went, along lanes and ro minor roads and things, wandering around. With Polly, who had a hickey leg, and with two greys, with those white head dot, I think it was white head dot, that Dad rode down the Foss Way. He had several called Dan. He seemed to like horses called Dan. The last one was called Golden Goss, who I thought was a little horror. I did not like Golden Goss. Oh, now his very first horse was a dapple called Dancing Girl. You see, poor mother was district nurse and had nothing but a bike. And I'd, it was a very big district. And because we, when we were little, she had to tie us on her back takers. What else could she do with us? Um, she thought a pony and trap would be a great advantage. So she sent Dad up to Appleby Fair. Or it might have been his suggestion, knowing Dad and his fondness for Appleby Fair. And he came back with Dancing Girl. Unfortunately, what he hadn't realised was that Dancing Girl had been in a circus. And every time Dancing Girl heard any music, she was on her hind legs dancing. Mother was livid. 
<laughs> but Dad, having been in the cavalry, just loved his horses. And gradually, he got more and more and more. And because of his horses, he met people that were interested in horses. And he had this wonderful trip riding the Foss Way with Nancy Spain and the lovely John Peel. And they would find a place of interest, say a manor or a haunted house or a tree where people had been hung and find the story about it and then broadcast it at night. And they often came to, uh, while they lived, they came to Kirby, stayed at the fleece and they all met and, and went riding together and used to tell the most wonderful stories and people would say, he made them up. Well, he might have embroidered them, but there was always a grain of truth in what he said. Really, the, the loon ra raconteur that John T. was, he, he, he knew an awful lot of things about, about the Loon Valley, and some of which were undoubtedly invention, but not probably thought to be memory by him. What else can I tell you about him, John, except he was a character and a half? and he could talk the hind leg of a donkey, you would still be listening when he, when he wished he would stop. <laughs> Wonderful man was John T. Yeah. A lovely man, a lovely man, Lord, his dad. Mm.